Okay, now we will have our first rebuttal for 10 minutes by Mr. Rogers. All right, thank you, Shadid. Um, I want to begin by observing the sloppy use of terms here that certainly don't reflect Christian theology that lead to the sort of uh, uh, false conclusions that my opponent uh, makes. He freely flows in and out of using terms like persons, beings, God, gods, and so forth. And I know at times he claimed that he was giving arguments for this, but I'm going to answer those momentarily. But do note that at least that's not the way Christians use the terminology. When Christians speak of the distinction of persons in the Trinity, we're not making a distinction of beings. We're making a distinction of personhood, which is not identical to being. If anybody is familiar with the English language, and it's true in all languages, there's a distinction between being and person. This podium has being. It's not a person. Whereas we say that God is a being who is three persons. He is tripersonal. And for that reason, we're able to say that he is in himself, for example, fully loving, uh, a fully communicative being, a fully, you know, a being who doesn't need to look outside of himself for things like love and fellowship and communication, as does the Islamic deity. Uh, the God of the Bible is fully self-contained in that way. This is not... Uh, uh, the sort of thing that gives rise to, you know, talking about separate beings and so forth. It's explicitly stated in our creeds, for example. We may not read them as much in some of our churches, but the, the creeds say, for example, we neither divide the substance, that is the essence of God that is possessed by all three persons, nor do we confound the persons, nor do we say that the persons are one and the same person. I understand that's a difficult concept, and that might in part be what's uh, behind my opponent insisting that's got to be polytheistic if I don't understand it. Uh, but that's not the same thing as being uh, an argument and being cogent. Let's run through these. Now, in, in some cases, he's arguing against the deity of Christ. In other cases, he's assuming it and saying, well, if that's the case, then it's polytheism. So I guess I've got to do sort of two things here at once. Uh, let me, as much as I can, relate this, though, back to uh, what I gave in my opening presentation. Notice that in my opening presentation, I said that God appeared on earth as a human being. He rained down the fire from heaven. The text explicitly says that. So do we go to the Old Testament text and say, well, if he is God, then how is he raining down fire from somebody else? Well, then he's not God, but the text says it. It says he's God. It calls him Yahweh, the person who spoke to Abraham. But he was on one, in one place at one time, apparently. No, I mean, as Christians, we recognize this is a, a voluntary act of condescension on God's part. It, it's not describing God in his limitless glory. This is God condescending to appear and speak to Abraham. And that is exactly what Jesus does in a, you know, much more extreme sense when he becomes incarnate. The Apostle Paul tells us that Jesus humbled himself and took on himself the form of a servant so that he might discharge the requirements of God's law and su suffer the penalty that we were going to endure if we, had not, uh, if we uh, did not repent and believe in him. This is how we are able to say things about Jesus that would otherwise not be true of him, simply considered as a divine person. For example, how could we say Jesus learned? He mentioned Luke chapter 2. He mentioned there were things Jesus didn't know. Those, that's not news to me, I've got to tell you. I believe that, and my very salvation, your salvation, hinges on that. If Jesus couldn't say that, then he wasn't a real human being. And if he wasn't a real human being, he couldn't have died on the cross. And if he didn't die on the cross, then you're still in your sins. And the, above all, man, the most to be pitied. No, Jesus became a real human being and thus was a divine person with a real human nature, in terms of which he, had, he was hungry, he slept, he wept, and he even died. Could God die? No, an incarnate person could, though. He had a real human nature. So all these verses have nothing to do with proving that Jesus is not God. Now, do they prove polytheism? Oh, well, let me go back over some of the other ones uh, just to make sure I cover all the bases here. He mentioned John chapter 20, verse 17, where it says that uh, I'm ascending to my God and your God, to my Father and your Father. Note, for one, the different way in which Jesus speaks of God as his God and Father and of him as our God and Father. There's a different relationship here, obviously, going on between Jesus. Why does he say it that way? My God and your God, my Father and your Father. Well, Christians recognize that God is our Father and our God through Christ. We relate to him through Christ. We could not call him our Father were it not for Christ. And by the way, it's not surprising Muslims can't call God their Father. They don't believe that he is a Father. Not only of the Lord Jesus Christ, but he's not the Father of anyone. And that's because there is no Christ in their system. 
Uh, and by the way, it is ironic, though, that they do have something co-equal and co-eternal with their God in some regard. Their Quran, which they say is Allah's word, is said to be eternal. And he told us that's polytheism. If it's polytheism, then his uh, own religion is guilty of polytheism for saying that there's an eternal book that exists alongside of their deity. Well, but that's not my view. I'm not even saying that Jesus is like that eternal book that exists independently of their God. Jesus is one in essence with the Father, shares the Father's very nature, and as such uh, is able to do things that only God could do and at the same time do things that uh, could only be true of a man. Uh, for example, he could pray. He asked, well, how could Jesus pray to God? Uh, he mentioned several passages. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me in Mark 15, 34? Or John 17, 3, where he's praying to the Father. By the way, note he's praying to the Father, which means he wasn't speaking to Shadid's God. He was speaking to the Father. And speaking to the Father, let me, let me point out to you what the whole context says, by the way. In John 17, Jesus said, Father, the hour has come, glorify your son. So he's asking God the Father to glorify him. Would a creature be able to say that? He goes on, so that the son may glorify you, even as you have given him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world began. This, is the Je this Jesus is saying he existed with the Father in heaven and came down to earth and is going to return to the Father. Golly, that sounds a whole lot like Genesis 18 and 19, doesn't it? And the, the, sort, the same sorts of things you can say in argument against Jesus being, not being God are the same sorts of things you could say against God not being God because in the Old Testament it's the very same scenario, right? God appearing on earth in the form of a man, even though there it was just temporary. Um, but now, again, is this polytheism? Not according to the standards of the Bible. The Bible says that God is a tripersonal being. Not three beings, not three essences, nothing of the sort. One eternal being possessed fully by three persons. Now, uh, again, I have to remind my opponent, and he's, he hasn't had the chance to rebut this yet, but according to his book, our position is not polytheistic. And if our position is polytheistic, if he's actually proven and demonstrated it, then he's going to have to get rid of the Quran. In fact, if you're done with it, by, at the end of the debate, you can give it to me because I have some use for it. Um, so uh, how much time do I have left? Two minutes. Okay, a couple of other passages, let me discuss them. Uh, as well, let me say this about John 17, 3. Notice that Jesus says, this is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. We already know from the Apostle John that he thinks Jesus is God. That's explicitly stated at the beginning of John's Gospel in the prologue. You're already told what you're supposed to see when you read the book. So if you read a verse that says something contrary to that, then you realize I missed the author's point. He also concludes the book on that same high note. Thomas, hakurios mu kai hatheos mu, my Lord and my God. So in between that, sandwiched in between that, are we finding a verse that says something other than that? No. When it says, this is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God, that's, in the first place, that's exactly true. Christians believe that the Father is the only true God. The, the, he, but he doesn't go on to say that Jesus is not God or that he's some other God. There's a fallacy involved in this kind of argument. I've heard it a million times. It, it, it assumes this. It assumes the argument is this. If one, and if and only if, one is the Father, then one is the only true God. Okay, since Jesus is not the Father, therefore uh, Jesus is not the only true God. Now, anybody uh, familiar with logic knows that this is a fallacy. Uh, it, it, it's something like this. It's basically uh, what we call the uh, fallacy of denying the antecedent, right? The text would be different if it, if it said, if and only if the Father is the only true God uh, and Jesus is not the Father, then it would prove that he's not true God. But if he's one with the Father, here's the point I'm driving at, if he's one with the Father in his essential nature, then saying the Father's the only true God would also imply his own divinity. Jesus says explicitly, same gospel, I and the Father are one. John chapter 10, verse 30. And that comes immediately after Jesus says, I give to my sheep eternal life. Who can do that but God? And then says, nobody can take them out of my hands, right? And he also says, we're in the Father's hands, and no one can take us out of his Father's hands. If you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 39, you'll note that these words come right out of that passage. 
God says, the Lord says, nobody can snatch them out of my hands. Check the Septuagint, the Greek rendition of the Old Testament. You'll see the language is virtually identical to the language spoken by Jesus. What's interesting is in the Hebrew there, what God calls himself is I am. It says, see, see that I am, and there's no other God besides me. I put to death, I make alive, I wound and I heal, and no one can deliver out of my hands. The language used by Jesus would have been understood by his first century hearers. And they would have understood it as a claim to deity and oneness and unity with the Father. Uh, my time is up. Now a 10-minute rebuttal by Mr. Lewis. Okay, uh, Tony, I don't have to get rid of the Quran at all because in Quran chapter 98, verse 6, although the people of the book have this... Uh, um, this different name that they're given, people of the book, they're still considered to be amongst the polytheists still, as chapter 98, verse 6 clearly shows. So I don't have to get rid of anything, so sorry, I won't be giving you my Quran after the debate. Sorry. Now, he says that um, he's not making a distinction of beings, but isn't it clear that they are different beings? The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Father. The Father and the Son are not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father or the Son. I showed you very clearly that Jesus no, doesn't know things that the Father is supposed to know. He refers to the Father as his very own God. And he said that in, in, in this verse, uh, John chapter 20, 17, that we can see how Jesus spoke differently. Actually, no, I don't see how he spoke differently. He actually says it very clearly. I go to my Father and your Father. No condition is given. No, no separate distinction is made. He says, I go to my God and your God. He doesn't make any distinction either. Okay? So it's clear that I showed you that they are clearly different. They have their own separate thoughts, own separate actions. They are not the one same being. So my point was that if you're telling me that Jesus is God, I'm, I'm going based on their argument, that if you're telling me that Jesus is God, and there's only one God, and these three members are the same God, why then is one of the members who's supposed to be God referring to another as his own God? Why doesn't he know what the other one knows? Why is he crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If they are the actual same one, if they're not distinct in their, their being, etc., they are distinct clearly in person and being. He's clearly not the same person or being as the Father. Matter of fact, he even tells you that the Father is greater than I. This contradicts the idea of being co-equal. And the word used here in Greek is megos. It means predicated of rank, as belonging to a person, eminent for their ability, their virtue, their authority, power, used of those who surpass others, Either in nature, because that's what they say, that, oh, no, they're the same, they have the same nature, same essence. Well, here it shows that this word is being used to show that the person, is, it surpasses the other in nature and power. So, again, clearly, if, he, if he's supposed to, my, that's my whole argument, if he's supposed to be God and there's only one God, another speaks of the other as God, he doesn't have the same power same attributes. He doesn't know the same things. Clearly, they can know, other than if you want to put a veil over yourself, it's clear that we are speaking of more than one God. He mentions it about Jesus uh, humbling himself, according to Philippians. But what does Jesus say about that, though? Does Jesus say that? Let's read. In John chapter 8, verse 42, it is said that Jesus says, if God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. If you're the same person, how are you being sent? If there's only one God, then why does he say I was sent by him? Him obviously is someone else. There's obviously someone else who's God. And if, 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 I'm using if, if Jesus is, I'm, again, I'm, we're not arguing today if Jesus is God or not. The argument is about polytheism according to the Trinity. 
So if Jesus is supposed to be God, that's what I want you to keep in mind. If he's God and he's telling you that another person sent him, isn't that more than one person? Isn't that more than one God? Because he refers to him as his God. So if he's God and he says, I have a God and this God sent me, if he's supposed to be God as well, then clearly this is more than one God. He mentions about the idea that uh, it said that he spoke, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Well, he also said the disciples are one also in John chapter 17, verse 21. He says that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. Are the disciples gods too? He spoke about the glory. Well, guess what? That same glory was also given to the disciples. John chapter 17, verse 22. And the glory which you have given me, again, and again, notice here, he's still talking about another being that has given him something. If you're the same God, why do you need to be given glory? You should already have the glory, right? Why is he saying the glory you're giving me? What do you mean given? You should already have it. You're supposed to be a member of the Godhead. You're supposed to be God already. You're supposed to be co-equal. What do you mean the glory you've given me? Shouldn't we have to be given anything. But he says the glory which you have given me, I have given them. Are they gods too? He says the glory you've given me, I have also given to them. So now, we, so then can we turn and say that these men, these followers of Jesus are God? He made this argument, which I didn't make because I'm, I'm trying to hold to the position that I'm saying you, keep you want me to believe that Jesus is God and that the Father is also God and that the Holy Spirit is God and that all these three are the same, supposed to be the same God. So I didn't say that if Jesus is not the Father, then he can't be God. No, I'm actually trying to hold to your argument. I'm trying to say, okay, for the sake of argument, that, okay, let's say Jesus is God. He's telling you that there's someone else who's God. So if he's God too, and the Father is also God, and the Father is his God, and the, and the Father is also his God and your God, that's clearly more than one God. If Stephen sees him in heaven, and he sees Jesus standing next to God, if, if again, I'm, I'm trying it for the sake of argument, accepting that Jesus is God for the sake of argument. So if he is God, and Stephen saw him standing next to God, Stephen is seeing two gods. That's the reality of it. He sees one God sitting, and then the other God, Jesus, is standing next to God. That's what it says. That's more than one God. Polytheism. Okay? <clears throat> so this is the argument. We're not debating the Quran right now. We're not debating what Muslims uh, feel about marrying non-believers or whatever the case. This topic is, is the belief in the Trinity polytheism. Belief in more than one God. I've clearly demonstrated that indeed it is. If you accept that Jesus is God, and you accept that the Father is God, and clearly that one is, doesn't know what the other knows, doesn't have the same power. When people look in heaven, they see someone sitting and another one sitting, standing next to the other. That's clearly, at least seeing two other persons, that's more than one God. And he said that as you Christians, you believe that the Father is the only true God. Well, that's sort of true, but don't you also believe that the Son is also the true God? But Jesus said, no, the Father is the only true God. So you believe, you believe that the Holy Spirit is also the true God. You believe that the Son is the true God, along with the Father being the only true God. The Father is the true God. The Son is the true God. The Holy Spirit is the true God. And we see throughout your scriptures that they all have different abilities. They have their own independent actions and thoughts. So therefore, as you see the three fingers right here, if they are God, then you definitely have three gods. The belief in the Trinity, I'm sorry to say, is polytheism. Okay, and now we have seven-minute counter rebuttals. Only seven minutes. Only seven minutes. Wow. That's a crime. You should have gotten the deluxe plan that rolled over. All right. Uh, my opponent, I better get right into this. My opponent uh, has tried to steer you away from the Quran here, and I can understand why he would do that. It's uh, not a book that's going to help him out on this. He said in Surah 98.6, uh, the Christians are included amongst the polytheists. But no, they're not. You can look at it yourself. Those who disbelieve among the polytheists of the, or excuse me, <laughs> those who disbelieve among the people of the scripture and the idolaters will abide in the fire of hell. The conjunction and presuppose the distinction. In fact, that's what he's trying to argue tonight, isn't it? When we speak of father and son and spirit. Well, at least here, 
Jews and uh, or Christians are distinguished from the polytheists. That was only one of nine reasons, by the way, why I said he'd have to jettison his Quran if he says that Christians are polytheists. There are many others, and I could have given more myself. Uh, now, as far as this idea, he said in his first rebuttal that I didn't get to, that the, or at least in his opening or somewhere along the lines, that the Jews never believed this. Uh, I don't know what he's been reading. Maybe he thinks that his next door neighbor is a good benchmark, his unbelieving apostate Jewish neighbor. But the question is, in this case, if that were relevant, it would be what did ancient Jews believe? Well, listen to this. Here's what uh, is written by Daniel Boyerin in an issue of the Harvard Theological Review. And Daniel Boyerin, by the way, is an Orthodox Jew. In fact, he's the professor of Talmudic culture at the Department of Near Eastern Studies and Rhetoric at the University of California, Berkeley. He's speaking here of the notion of the memra, what I mentioned earlier, the word who rained down fire from heaven, the logos. He says, and I quote, although the official rabbinic theology, which is after Christianity, suppressed, held down, all talk of the memra of, or logos by naming it the heresy of two powers in heaven, both before the rabbis and contemporaneously with them, there was a multitude of Jews in both Palestine and the diaspora who held on to this version of monotheistic theology. Here he's saying that the Jews believed in at least two persons uh, on this, just dealing with the word here, the word, the memory of the Lord, and the Lord himself, and this is called monotheistic theology by this orthodox Jew, and I could easily quote many others. But really, I want you to notice this. When he says the Jews didn't believe that, that just begs the question. I argued from Genesis 18 and 19 that they did believe, or at least ought to have believed, in two divine persons. There was no argument for that. There was no rebuttal. What is the response to Genesis 19.24? There isn't one. Now remember, he keeps saying, if, if, if they're gods, then, because he, and he, I don't know why he thinks he's not been arguing back and forth, sometimes that Jesus is not God, other times that he is. At time, what was the point then of arguing that he doesn't know all things? To which I replied that he was also a human being, and therefore had real human attributes and characteristics, not only divine attributes. Uh, the point of that was to say he's not really called God in the Bible, but he is. And the reason for pointing out that the Bible speaks of both uh, persons as God is because of this, the argument that he didn't respond to, which was, if Moses, who was a monotheist, well, this isn't the words of Moses, so I better put that aside. If Moses, who was a monotheist, taught that there was more than one divine person in the Godhead, then it follows inescapably that the Trinity, the belief that God is more than one person, is monotheistic, even by his assumptions. Understand that. You can't get around that. A deductive argument is sound unless you can refute one of the premises. The conclusion follows necessarily. The premises haven't been refuted. The same thing when it comes to Jesus. Jesus taught his own divinity in John chapter 8. Did you hear a response to that? You didn't. What you heard was him bringing up many verses, maybe hoping that I might miss one. And I'm sure I've missed one or two, but I haven't missed all of them. And I've shown you something of the idea of how each one can be replied to. And by the way, this business about uh, Jesus in uh, uh, heaven next to the Father, according to Stephen in Acts 7, notice he wants to press, press the idiom literally here. He wouldn't do that in his own Quran. It says that he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God, and he even hit his arm. Do you think God has an arm walking around? We're not Mormons, we're Christians, and I don't know any Christian who believes that. But there are Muslims, by the way, who believe that God has an arm, literally, and they point to the Quran for that. I don't think my opponent believes that, but there are Muslims who do. I'm sure he wouldn't want me playing that game with him. Well, so what are the arguments then? The argument is this. Moses and Jesus are both monotheists. By his admission, by mine. The Quran and the Bible. And the Quran even distinguishes between Jews and Christians on the one hand and polytheists on the other. So my opponent is stuck, I think, between a rock and a hard place. And I do think you have to give me your Quran in light of that, by the way. Uh, Oh, well, let me comment on this before I forget. Uh, Jesus said, uh, the Father's greater than I am. Okay, uh, in, in John 14, 28, I, I've got to say, I, and I mean this uh, with all due respect, when he made the statement that the word greater means uh, surpassing either in uh, nature, and then he, he stopped there and he, made, he interjected something. Maybe this was a mistake on his part. But he, he went on to complete the sentence in this way, and I'll do it the whole way. Uh, he, uh, he surpasses either in nature and power. That couldn't be something that he read from a scholarly book because that's not even good grammar. When you say either, 
You're saying either this or that. It could either mean this or that. What did the source he read really say? I'm excited to see after the debate. Because it has to be saying either in this way or maybe it means it in this way. So for example, a source, and I can tell you the Greek term, uh, means uh, it could refer to a person's position or his function. Okay? Uh, the president is greater than I am. Okay? Uh, but he's got an arm like I do, by the way. Uh, his position is greater than mine, but his essence isn't. Jesus, according to Paul, humbled himself. He says Jesus didn't teach that because Jesus was sent by the Father. That was the argument. In John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He took on himself human attributes and characteristics. That's not a disproof of his deity, and it's not a proof that he's a second God. It is a proof that he is a second person, distinct from the Father. I agree with all those verses, and I didn't need to be convinced of that tonight. I agree there's only one God. I agree that Father, Son, and Spirit are distinct persons. What I disagree with him on is that this necessarily entails polytheism for all the reasons I've given. They are one in essence, and one of the persons can condescend and had, uh, did condescend. Oh, by the way, in John 17, 3, he said that... Uh, uh, the glory will be given to the disciples. Very different context. Notice the glory given to the disciples is not one that they had with the Father before the world began. And that's Jesus talking about this condescension. He said he dismissed Paul in order to fly off to Jesus. Here's Jesus saying the same thing. He existed in heaven with the Father and shared the same glory. How could that be unless he were truly divine? And, and what does that entail regarding his... Uh, and I better conclude. All right. Thank you very much. And seven minutes, Mr. Lewis. Okay. All right. Once again, <clears throat> the Quran gives the Christians and Jews a special title as people of the book. Nonetheless, they are still con considered those who associate partners to God. They're just given a special title because they still come from you know, the lineage of, of the prophets. So they're given this distinction as opposed to others who are completely, uh, who completely have a different or come from a totally different belief system. Still, nonetheless, chapter 98, verse 6, clearly equates them and says they will wind up in the same place. Okay, so I'm still going to keep my Quran. <laughs> now, uh, again, uh, so, uh, maybe you didn't hear me correctly. I didn't say that uh, the Jews didn't believe in the idea you were spoken about. My, my, what I said clearly was that the Jews didn't believe in Jesus as their God. They didn't believe in the, the ancient Israelites did not believe that there was God the Father and there's this other God, a second person's son named Jesus. That's what I said. That's what I said. I didn't say about the man. And plus the, the Memra, ask any Jew. Go, go to the Jewish gods and ask them, is the Memra the Trinity? Is the Memra the Trinity? Ask them if the belief in the Jewish Memra is the Trinity. The answer will be No. And at most, the Memra is, is, is speaking of two persons. That's not your trinity. Your trinity is three persons. But again, ask the Jews, do they believe that the Memra is the Christian trinity? Has it ever been the Christian trinity? Did Moses ever believe that Jesus was God? Did he ever even mention Jesus? That, yeah, we have the God, the Father, and God, the Son, his name is Jesus. The answer, we already know. It's no. Now, he says that I'm going back and forth whether Jesus is, is God or not. Actually, I'm not, I'm not giving these verses to discount whether Jesus is God. As I said, for the sake of argument, I'm trying to hold to the Christian position that Jesus is God. And I'm saying to you that, okay, I'm, a, I'm for the sake of argument, if he's God, but he speaks of another as God, or he cries out to another that has forsaken him as God, or he says that his God is your God, and he, and he is God for the sake of argument, then clearly there's more than one God. Because this one who is God, he's clearly addressing someone else as God. He's telling you that that God is his God. He's telling you that if he is God, again, I'm like, for the sake of argument, he's telling you he doesn't know what this other God knows. He's telling you that this other God is greater than him. He's telling you that this other God has forsaken him. If he's God and he's telling you, he's talking to someone else as my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Clearly there is, has to be another God that he's speaking of. Is he talking to himself? Is he talk, if he is one God and there's only one God, then is, what is he doing? Is he talking to himself? When he says, my God, why have you forsaken me? Who is he talking to? 
If he's the only God, who's he talking to? Obviously, he's not talking to himself. He's talking to someone else that has forsaken him. So if he is God for the sake of argument and he's crying out to someone else, then obviously there must be another God, polytheism. Uh, he brought up John 8.42. Again, saying that uh, that's not what Jesus uh, spoke in relation to uh, uh, Philippians, humbling himself. Well, look what he says here. He says, I proceeded forth and came, from, uh, and came from God, neither came I of myself. Philippians says, yes, he did come of himself. Philippians says, Jesus took it upon himself and humbled himself and made himself as a servant. Here Jesus says, I did not come of myself, but he sent me. That means somebody who has more power than him, someone who has more power than him sent him. Philippians says, he humbled himself, meaning it was a voluntary action. He himself took a lower position, came as a man. But here Jesus says, no, I did not come of myself. It was not a voluntary action. I didn't come of myself, but he sent me. He sent me. I didn't come on my own. He sent me. And then again, John 17, 22, says that the, the glory that was given to them was something different. Well, if you remember that in the, in the same chapter, in the previous verses, He's supposed to be asking God to give him the glory that he had, right? He's, he's supposed to be asking God to give him the glory that he had with God before. So now if he gets that, now in verse 22, he's saying, look, and the glory which you have given me. Well, in this same chapter, he was already asking God to give him that glory. So now he says, the glory that you've given me, which, I, which according to the context, he must be, it has to be the same glory that he was just asking for. He says, the glory that you've given me that I had with you, I give to them now. So if this, is supposed to, if this is supposed to make him God, and he's sharing this glory with others, what's going on here then? Are these also gods too? And again, the point is, I'm accepting your position for the sake of argument. That if he's God, why is God asking God to give him glory? Whether to share it or not, the, the sharing part really is irrelevant. The point is, if he's God and there's only one God, why then is he asking this other God to give him glory? Clearly, he's talking to someone else who is God. So if he's God, which I, like I said, for the sake of argument, to put it in that context, Jesus is God. He's talking to someone else, asking that God to give him glory. Is that not more than one God? They're clearly talking to each other. They're clearly talking to each other. How can they not be more than one God if the two, if the two are talking and conversing? If, again, if it was one person and you were telling me that these are just different aspects of the same person, I'd say, okay, I see what you're saying. But no, that's not what we see here. We see, again, independent thought, independent actions. One has more power than the other. One has less power. One has more knowledge. One has less knowledge. One forsakes the other. Clearly, we are dealing with more than one person or being who is supposed to be God. So again, as I say, from this evidence, it is clear that indeed, the belief in the Trinity is a belief in reality in polytheism. Thank you. Okay, we come to our concluding statements, five minutes each. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lewis. I look forward to uh, the time we have afterwards for further discussion, and I'll bet you all wish that you could be there for that too. Uh, I'm sure you can write Shadid and uh, exchange your thoughts with him and maybe see what he thinks of the aftermath. But uh, let me conclude uh, by pointing out that my two, my major arguments tonight really haven't been answered or even, I think, broached as far as I can recall. My point was that we both affirm that Moses and Jesus were monotheists. He believes in that. But I proved that Moses and Jesus both taught that Jesus was a second divine person. And by the way, I don't have to prove that further point that the, uh, the Holy Spirit is a divine person. I can do that. But I did, and I did in some part uh, cash in on that by pointing out Matthew 28. In principle, what I'm saying is if I've proven two persons is not polytheism, then the third follows by a matter, by, by simple, you know, follow through. Uh, if two persons is not polytheism, three isn't, right? Each person is one with the other in their essential nature. Now, he said uh, to try and get his Quran back, and I'm going to get that Quran. Uh, I, I think that's the door prize or something. Uh, he said that the, the Quran clearly distinguishes between these two. It just gives them different titles. 
I mean, it, it, it doesn't clearly distinguish between them. It just gives them different titles since they both had different backgrounds, apparently. No, it clearly distinguishes between them. Remember the distinction I pointed out. Surah 2, 221 says you can't marry polytheists. Surah 5, 5 says you can marry Christians, people of the book. Is that not a distinction? Well, uh, he tried to come back on this memra business about the Jews not really believing that. Again, says who? What Jew? My wife's a Jew. <laughs> She'll tell him differently. Uh, she'll probably leave it up to me, but uh, the, I quoted for you a Jew, an actual Jewish scholar who said otherwise in the Harvard Theological Review. I, I suspect that his testimony means something, and I've read the Targums. I can tell you the belief is there. It's unavoidable. It's in your face, and it's called monotheism by Daniel Boyeran, an Orthodox Jew who has an axe to grind, who has every reason not to want that to be true. Uh, he spent most of his rebuttal period pointing out that uh, Jesus is giving glory to the disciples. Um, I thought I already responded to that, and I'll just say in conclusion that the glory that he talks about giving them, and I think he, I, a lot of that was convoluted for me, honestly, at this point in the debate, but the glory that Jesus had with the Father is a glory he had with the Father before the world began. That's not said of the disciples. That's not said of you and me. We were not there. He was because he's the word who existed in the beginning with God. That's what John says. He existed in the beginning with God. Notice the distinction. He keeps saying, how could he talk to God? How could there be different persons? He spoke. He was there with God. But then it also says, and he was God. If you pay attention to the Greek there, or if you uh, pick up a commentary that discusses it, you'll note that what the author is doing there is very uh, incredibly uh, put. He says, the word who was with God Tantheon, the God, and the word was God, theos, meaning he was the same in nature as the God that he is with. That's the literal upshot of the Greek. He was with God and was by nature what the God he is with was and is. One in nature. That's why all these statements can be made about personal distinctions that don't imply three uh, gods. They're not separate in their essential nature. Jesus did condescend and enter into the world, according to Philippians chapter 2. And he said that was contradictory to what uh, uh, Jesus said, that I was sent. Because it says I took upon myself. What it says there is that Jesus took upon himself a human nature. He took upon him the form of a servant. It's not saying he wasn't sent by the Father. Those two things are not contradictory. If you think they're contradictory, we need another uh, a whole session to talk about what a contradiction is. No, those two statements are complementary. The Father sent him, and Jesus obeyed for us men and for our salvation. He took upon himself a human nature. He humbled himself. He set aside his divine glory. He entered into the world, and he lived a real human life. He lived a life that we never lived and couldn't live unto God, and he lived it for our sakes. That's why Jesus offers us eternal life if we put our trust in him, and only if we put our trust in him. He says, I give unto them, that is my sheep, those who believe in me, eternal life. His prophet couldn't say that. Our God could, our Lord Jesus Christ, whom he admits was a monotheist. That monotheist believed in his own deity and also in his distinct personhood from the Father. Uh, I readily grant to you that's a mystery beyond our understanding, beyond our kin. But if you thought that God was just like you, then you had something to learn tonight, I can assure you. In the Psalms, we're told that that was part of the problem that people had back in those days. They said, God said to them, you thought that I was just like you. They found out otherwise. And I'm hoping that my opponent doesn't find out otherwise, because the same Jesus, who maybe wasn't called Jesus during the days of Moses, but the one whom the Jews called the Word, who is distinct from the Father, came down from heaven, spoke with Abraham, and destroyed a wicked group of people. That same Jesus says he's going to come back and deal out retribution to those who know not God, and believe not in his eternal divine son. Good way to end with a, with a sermon, but not dealing with the subject matter. Now, again, as I said, the, the Quran clearly gives a different title to people of the book, but nonetheless, they are still considered 
to be those who associate partners to God. So an exception is made that we can marry from the people of the book once again because of, although them being labeled as such, that we still have some things that are in common, such as being uh, in, in believing in the prophets and Abraham and things of this nature. So an, an exception is made for marrying a, a Jewish woman or a Christian woman. Now, uh, he said that Moses taught that Jesus was the second person. Uh, where's that at? I've never seen Moses mention anything about Jesus. Never hear any time that Moses spoke about God the Son or God the Holy Spirit. Never seen Moses mention any such words. He says that I said that the Jews didn't believe in the memory. No, that's not what I said. I said the Jews don't believe that the memory is the Trinity. That's what I said. The Jews don't believe the memory is the Trinity. I didn't say that they don't believe in the memory. I said they do. But I said go ask them. Do they believe that the memory is the Trinity? Okay, I didn't say that they don't believe in it. I said they don't believe it's the Trinity. Is that clear? They do not believe the memory is the Christian Trinity. He spoke about, again, the, the, the glory with, with the Father. Once again, glory with the Father. If there's only one God, then there's nobody to be with. If there's only one God, there's no one to be with. It says he has the glory, he wants the same glory that he had with the Father. So it's him and there's this other person or this other being. If they're both God and he's with this other person, then clearly there's more than one God there. He mentioned about John 1.1. 1, 1. Some argue that because when it says the word uh, and the word is God, that in the Greek the definite article is not there. It just says theos instead of whole theos. So they say that it actually should be translated as a God or a divine figure, not God himself, because the definite article is not there. He said, but Jesus believed in his own deity. I don't see that. In John chapter 8, verse 40, Jesus clearly says, now you seek to kill me, a man. And he's not using the word man as in a male figure. He uses the word anthropos. It means a human being. He doesn't say a man and a, a man who's a God and a human being. No, he says, I'm a human being, anthropos. So he's actually telling you he believes that he's a human being. And he says, I'm a human being who heard the truth from God. If he's God and there is another and, and he heard from God, who is the other God that he's hearing from? Right? So once again, I'm willing to accept the Christian argument for the sake of argument that, okay, Jesus is God. Okay. But he says, I heard the truth from God. So here's one God hearing the truth from another God. If he's God and they're the same, why is he saying, I heard the truth from God? Shouldn't he already know the truth? So this is another example to show you that if you want to maintain this position, that Jesus is God, the Father is God, the Holy Spirit is God, they clearly cannot be seen as one and the same God because here he's telling you again, I heard the truth from God. He obviously didn't have the truth himself. He had to hear it. From God. So if he is God and he says, I heard the truth from God, then we clearly have more than one God here. This again is sad to say is polytheism. I'm not going to preach to you. I'm not going to give you, try to give you an Islamic sermon at the end. Just go search the truth. Sure, it sounds good. I can, I can easily say yes. So if you want salvation, come to Islam, come to the Quran and you will be guided. Look, I'm not here for that. If you, you can search the truth for yourself. The point is that it is clear. That if you maintain this position of believing in the Trinity, you can say all day long that it's only one God. But the reality, when you look at these verses and evidence that I've given you, it is clear that if that is the case, it is indeed polytheism and not monotheism. Well, again, pay attention to those things. If, if he's God, he says, I heard the truth from God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Ask yourself the question, if he's God, why is he referring to somebody else as God? Why is he saying, I heard from God? Why is he saying, God sent me? Why is he saying, one is greater than me? Why is he saying, I don't know that, that day, only the Father knows that day? Why even refer to somebody else if there's only one God and you're that one God? If you're that one same God, why even refer to somebody else having more knowledge than you? Or favoring you? Or giving glory to you? Why even say that if there's more than one God? So again, if that is the case, then clearly... If you're honest with yourself, you will see that we are clearly dealing with more than one God. This is polytheism.